Yes, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to warmly welcome our three keynote speakers, Professor Ulrike Hahn, Professor Bart Verhey, and Professor Jan Sprenger. Moreover, I'm happy to see here also our commentators, Dr. Barbara Ozimani, Dr. Daniela Glavanichova, and Dr. Jonas Rab. Uh, as you already know, this workshop is organized by our small department of logic and methodology of sciences with the support of the APBB project, uh, Analysis, Reconstruction, and Evaluation of Arguments, and also by our VEGA project, Attitudes in Communication and Argumentation. The aim of organizing this workshop has been primarily to get a, a couple of professional scholars whose research has affinity to the study of arguments uh, from slightly different uh, research and academic uh, traditions and perspectives. Uh, and I'm really excited to have right, these excellent scholars and researchers here today. Uh, before introducing our first guest, uh, let me briefly mention some practical information. Uh, the workshop is split into two sessions, the morning session and the afternoon session. In each of them, there will be a talk uh, followed by a special commentary and a rejoinder by the keynote speaker. After that, there is a room for a general discussion. Uh, in case you want to ask a question or raise a comment, uh, please send just a letter Q into the chat and I, I can call you out uh, in the discussion. Also, I want to remind you that the content of the workshop is being recorded and it will be displayed at our project's website later. So, uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Jan Mikhail Sprenger. Uh, Jan holds a full professorship position at the University of Turin, where he works at the Center for Logic, Language, and Cognition since uh, 2017. He's a very productive and successful researcher, specializing on the philosophy of science with a particular interest in scientific, uh, especially statistical inference, causation, and scientific method in general. He has been also a successful principal invest investigator in ERC grants, and actually he is involved in the print project uh, from models to decisions. Jan is also a keen chess player participating in various tournament games. And today, Jan is going to talk on severe testing as it is captured in Bayesian inferential setting. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the um, kind introduction, uh, Lukas. Uh, let me just share my slides at this point. Yeah. Uh, boop, 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 boop. This should be the right ones. You can see them? Yes, perfect. perfect. Now I'm just, um, just putting them in full screen mode so that I can also see them myself. Thank you. Uh, good. So, uh, yes, thank you very much for this invitation and for the um, opportunity to, um, uh, to give this uh, talk on a topic which I find extremely uh, fascinating. So let me give you, let's say, perhaps some context about the um, uh, talk. So, um, the, or about the research project. Um, it was, I promised as a part of my application um, to the ERC for this uh, starting grant on uh, objectivity and scientific inference. I also promised to try to find common grounds between Bayesian and frequentist inference, and in particular to argue that Bayesian statistical uh, inference can also, so inference based on the principle of subjective probability on the subjective interpretation of probability as degrees of belief. That inferences based on this interpretation can also um, reconstruct an important methodological virtue in uh, scientific and statistical hypothesis testing, that is the severity of tests. This has historically been a big challenge for Bayesians, um, but I think in the light of recent developments and recent techniques, perhaps prospects are not so bad. And uh, perhaps let's say it's time to uh, stop thinking that Bayesians cannot account for severe testings or that frequentists, so let's say the traditional classical statistics have a privileged um, position with respect to severe tests. 
for quite some years, this project um, didn't really um, uh, advance because I was uh, focusing on other uh, work within the framework of my ESC project, uh, other papers. And um, but then let's, last year we uh, took it up again, and together with my uh, PhD student uh, Noah van Dongen, who is now a postdoc in Amsterdam with Danny Borsbaum uh, in a psychology group. Uh, psychological method research group and with the uh, statistician and uh, cognitive scientist Erik Jan Wachmakers. Um, we have uh, written a paper which got major revisions uh, with un very uncertain uh, outcome in which we explain our view of uh, why um, a Bayesian inference can account for severe testing. So all I'm presenting right now is joint work with uh, Noah and uh, Eric Jan, and after the talk, I'll also uh, send you the link to the paper and write their names in the chat because I forgot to add them uh, to the slides. Um, good, and uh, as I said, so let's say in case you have clarification question, I'm saying I'm introducing concepts you don't know, feel free to interrupt me. It's after all a uh, workshop with um, uh, uh, not, let's say, a relatively limited number of participants. So I think we can also use the uh, time as we want, and I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of the general discussion time. Um, good. So let's say um, I've already, let's say, uh, sketched the research question in my introduction. Bayesian statistics is a highly successful program uh, with a lot of advances and with ever more papers and also experimental papers in social science and natural science, which are using Bayesian statistics. And the question is why are many methodologists and also philosophers of science opposed to this? Why don't they like it? And I mean, apart, let's say, from very general concerns about the subjective interpretation of probability, um, the answer you hear most frequently is that it doesn't account for the severe testing of hypotheses. And quite recently, Deborah Mayo has articulated um, this uh, objection in her um, uh, recent book on statistical inference. So that's Deborah Mayo, and she will be, let's say, our main uh, opponent uh, in this talk. So let's say we think that she is a bit too pessimistic with respect to uh, Bayesian inference, and we will try to argue for it. However, of course, let's say also Popper didn't really like the subjective uh, interpretation of probability. Um, and he's, of course, um, the um, uh, philosopher who developed the uh, idea of severe testing in the context of scientific methods. So let's briefly recap what Popper has to say on, let's, on the severity of tests and why it is important and what it really means. So I will just briefly give a history of severe testing from Popper to Mayo. Then I will tell something about base factors and Bayesian statistics in general. And base factors are the Bayesian standard measure of evidence in statistics. And then I will tell about how base factors and specific ways of working with base factors can uh, account for severity and inference. And then let's say I will summarize and uh, leave some space for discussion. Okay. Let's start with, let's say, the um, historical part. Uh, how did CVR testing develop from Popper to Mayo? So uh, starting with Popper, um, he emphasized that scientific theories must be testable uh, in order, to, uh, um, uh, let's say, for a discipline to be scientific, it must make testable claims, falsifiable claims. And moreover, when we are, let's say, uh, trying to test theories, uh, we shouldn't just uh, use tests with which, which, with a very high probability, we confirm the hypothesis, but we will have uh, to use severe tests, that is, tests where it is plausible that the um, result will uh, falsify the theory. Or, more specifically, if the theory had been wrong, it would, uh, the test would be able to discover it. And only such severe tests, which where we do, do a, uh, where we um, do a sincere attempt to prove a theory wrong, are tests from which we can obtain genuine confirmation of a scientific theory. This is more or less what he develops in uh, um, some essays in conjectures and refutations, and in uh, logic of scientific discovery, 
particularly in the tense chapter, Popper uses corroboration instead of confirmation, but that's just um, a linguistic uh, detail. And um, Popper also stresses that, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, the theories need to be highly testable. Just they need to make precise and risky predictions. So predictions which are not uh, taken for granted given the status of our scientific knowledge. And confirmation then grows of a theory, then grows with the number of severe tests it has survived, or let's, in other words, the number of refutation attempts it was able to uh, um, uh, reject, um, and the diversity of severe tests. So let's say rather uh, that's a sort of variety of evidence thesis, rather than doing the same test uh, over and over again, it is better to test the theory in different ways. Okay, all this sounds, I guess, probably still rather familiar and quite uh, plausible. And the basic idea of all this is that a theory severely tested means that it can survive a stringent scrutiny. What exactly does the severity then mean? Um, uh, let's say on the operational level, what, how can, let's say, a scientist uh, determine whether he's really doing a severe test or whether it just appears to be severe? Um, one important uh, point for Popper is specificity in prediction and, as a consequence, the possibility of falsification. So here's some quote from the logic of scientific discovery. Um, the theories may be more or less severely testable, that is to say, more or less easily falsifiable. According to the greater and lesser risk of the sectors ruled out by them, theories might then be said to have more or fewer potential falsifiers. So what Popper does here is to, uh, to say, let's say, um, if I'm perhaps interested, let's say, suppose the theory makes a prediction for the range of a certain parameter. And uh, let's say this parameter is a real number. And uh, a theory has the more potential falsifiers, um, the more, uh, the bigger the sector of, let's say, of the real line, which it rules to be incompatible uh, as a parameter value um, with, the, uh, with the theory, right? So a theory has the more falsifiers, let's say, um, the bigger the measure, if you want, of the uh, sector, uh, which is incompatible with the theory itself. And it is the more falsifiable, uh, the more specific it is, and the more precise prediction uh, it makes. So um, if, I don't know, uh, for the gravitational constant, uh, we just say it's, let's say, it's a number uh, uh, smaller than one million, this is probably uh, not a very um, uh, precise uh, prediction. However, um, if we, let's say, if we take the actual value of the, um, uh, the if, let's say, if we predict the actual uh, value of the gravitational constant up to, I don't know, five decimals, that's already a uh, quite precise prediction. And Popper then also explains how corroboration or confirmation relates to severity. Here is also very uh, precise uh, and specific. This is from objective knowledge. Um, by the degree of corroboration of a theory, which you can also just read as confirmation, I mean a concise report evaluating the state of the critical discussion of a theory with respect to the way it solves its problems, its degree of testability, the very severity of tests it has undergone, and the way it has stood up to these tests. Corroboration or degree of corroboration is thus an evaluating report of past performance. Like preference, it is essentially comparative. So the confirmation of a theory is is evaluated post hoc, post experimentally, as a function of both the severity of the test and the performance uh, in these severe tests. This is important because when we later develop our Bayesian account, these are exactly the same elements which will come back um, in uh, right there. What Popper doesn't do, unfortunately, is to tell us how we should um, apply severe testing in the context of statistical inference. So Popper is, uh, let's say, the standard example is, um, is inference in physics, especially the transition from Newtonian to a relativistic physics. Um, 
and um, other examples of more or less, uh, let's say, uh, theories that made more or less deterministic predictions. Um, proper risk, according to, um, let's say, something that Maya writes um, in an essay, she, uh, she had the uh, pleasure and the privilege to get to know Popper. Um, he was actually uh, regretting that he didn't really learn statistics or never, let's say, engaged with statistical inference. But it's obvious that if you want, let's say, um, general methodology of severe testing in science, uh, then we also need to apply to the context of statistical inference. And uh, Popper, unfortunately, uh, didn't really do this probably also because the modern theory of statistics was developed in the 1920s and 30s and the consensus started to uh, evolve in the 1950s when Popper's most creative period was already coming to an end. I think everything from the mid 1950s onwards is basically translation of his earlier works in German to English and um, let's say, exploring some general, um, let's say, more general um, aspects in philosophy of science of his philosophy of his earlier work. But um, let's say the most creative and um, interesting parts of his work have been developed when also Popper was a young man. Um, and um, so, uh, unfortunately, he didn't later in his life, he didn't catch up with the developments in statistics in order to show how his theory would apply to it. It would have been very interesting to see. Um, and uh, what is important for us is that severe testing is not the same like a standard null hypothesis significance testing methodology. So whenever you see this acronym NHST, uh, it's just null hypothesis significance testing, which is what I'd say what most uh, experimental scientists are doing in the daily work. How does it work? I'll give you a very brief tutorial. So let's say you usually you have a uh, hypothesis that an effect, the actual effect of an intervention differs from a default value. The default value is described by means of a so-called null hypothesis. So let's say uh, COVID-19 vaccination doesn't decrease the uh, rate of COVID infections. Um, and then you have an alternative hypothesis, which is uh, it actually does increase the, uh, uh, sorry, it actually does decrease the rate of um, COVID-19 um, infections in a reference framework. And this effect has at least a certain size to be practically uh, interesting. Um, and this hypothesis um, uh, of interest, so that the effect is bigger than zero or, or let's say practically significantly bigger than zero is uh, accepted when we reject the null hypothesis. That is, if the observed results are sufficiently unlikely under the null hypothesis that we um, um, do not consider it tenable anymore. And then you have this famous evaluation in terms of p-values. Uh, the p-values basically indicate the tail of the probability distribution, which is even more, which corresponds to even more extreme results than the one we have actually observed. And this is how you proceed in uh, randomized controlled trials, also in uh, observational studies and in uh, experiments in psychology and so on. The problem with this um, procedure is that this doesn't justify an inference to any particular hypothesis about effect size. Because, because everything you have done when you have, let's say, um, accepted uh, uh, the hypothesis of interest or rejected the null hypothesis, is you have inferred to the hypothesis that the effect is not equal to the default value or greater than zero. And uh, so let's say in Popper's, um, in Popper's terminology, you have, let's say your hypothesis is very, very unspecific. It's almost maximally uninformative. The only thing that it says is that the uh, parameter value is different from zero. And it, the same, let's say for the prediction it makes. I mean, if you infer to the hypothesis that the uh, parameter value is different from zero, or even if you infer that it's greater than uh, zero or greater than the default value um, on the level of predictions. There's still a huge number of data or data patterns which are compatible 
with the hypothesis you have just inferred. So let's say neither on the level of the hypothesis itself, nor on the level of the prediction it makes, uh, your inference is very, uh, leads to very uh, specific results. And this is something that uh, Deborah Mayo in particular uh, has um, observed and she has tried to uh, find, let's say, um, uh, conceptualization of the standard um, standard statistical inference procedures, which doesn't have these problems, which is more Popperian in spirit. So here she is. And so Mayo is particularly known for two books, Error and uh, the, uh, the Growth of Experimental Knowledge, which she wrote in 1990s, or which was published in 1996. And uh, a more recent book, uh, Statistical Inference and Severe Testing, I think is the title, 2018 uh, with Cambridge. Um, and uh, we will mainly give a criticism of her views from that later book, which because it's also more specific um, in, on statistics. So um, how does Mayo uh, describe severe testings in, um, uh, in the context of statistical inference? So she writes, in the severe testing view, Probability arises in scientific context to assess and control how capable methods are at uncovering and avoiding erroneous interpretations of data. That's what it means to view statistical inference as severe testing. The probability that a method commits an erroneous interpretation of data is an error probability or commits that we make a uh, mistaken in inference. Statistical methods based on error probabilities I call error statistics, and that's what she's mainly uh, concerned with. And then she goes on. We have evidence for a claim C just to the extent that it survives a stringent scrutiny. This is proper again, of course. If C passes a test that was highly capable of finding flaws or discrepancies from C, and yet none of you are found, the passing result is evidence for C. So we all also see whether, let's say, why the um, uh, standard uh, null hypothesis testing uh, wouldn't, mm, wouldn't satisfy this definition because, let's say, if we observe, um, uh, if we infer to the hypothesis, for example, that the COVID-19 vaccination had, has at least a, a minimal effect, then um, um, uh, let's say the capability of finding flaws or discrepancies from C uh, would have to be evaluated to all with respect to all hypotheses um, that are different from C. And of course, that would still be a huge lot of hypotheses, not only zero effect, but also uh, smaller effects. And uh, it's not so clear um, um, uh, whether, let's say, this, a standard methodology really satisfies uh, this principle. It even gets worse for uh, two-sided tests, which are very common in uh, social science and psychology in particular, where you can have, let's say, the hypothesis just says it's different from the default value. And uh, then any passing result can probably be explained um, um, in, a, in a specific way. Um, so, however, we are not really um, happy with the severity principle for two reasons. Uh, the first one is that Maya makes no reference to the scope or the universality of the tested claim and the specificity of the prediction it makes. So if you re remember or recall uh, this Popperian um, framework or this conceptual framework, it was very important that the uh, tested claim is actually informative. Mm that it rules out some relevant states of the world and that also the predictions it makes are specific. This dimension of severity is completely lost in this uh, formulation of the principle. And also when we talk about stringent scrutiny, how can we, let's say, uh, how can we test, uh, uh, be highly capable of finding differences from the test that claim C if we don't mention explicit alternative hypothesis? So at least we should, let's say, indicate a direction which can be, let's say, different parameter values or perhaps violations of the IID assumption or anything else. But we need, let's say, to be, uh, we cannot just say a claim C is 
evaluated with respect to, uh, uh, let's say, all the uh, logical possibilities um, uh, which are uh, incompatible with C. C. So we have to uh, be more restrictive. So if the alternative to C encompasses all that is possible, except C itself, no test, no matter how probative it usually is, will be uh, capable of severely testing C. Okay, um, let's perhaps look in order to, uh, let's say, this is, let's say, a general conceptual uh, objection to Meyer's uh, severity principle. Let's perhaps look at how she um, explicates severity in more detail. So we have already seen that she doesn't think that null hypothesis significance testing is amounts to a severe test, but what else? So here is her uh, severity requirement. For data to warrant hypothesis age requires not that just that, and now come two uh, criteria or two conditions, sorry, age agrees with the data, or in other words, age passes the test, but also with high probability, age would not have passed the test so well where age falls. So um, this is similar to what we have seen before that if, let's say, uh, the age had been false, uh, with high probability, we would have observed a different result that would have agreed less well uh, with the hypothesis age. And uh, let's say for the above reasons, that let's say two-sided hypothesis just don't have an explicit uh, direction of uh, departure from the hypothesized value. Um, she's focusing on one-sided tests. So tests like the one which I have here on the slides, where let's say the null hypothesis is that the parameter is uh, smaller than or equal a certain value, and the alternative hypothesis that it's greater than that value plus a certain minimal effect size, which is usually supposed to mean something like practical significance. I mean, if you, are, if you have a COVID-19 vaccination that reduces your uh, infection rate by 1%, uh, you are probably uh, not very happy. Um, let's say, or which has a relative risk reduction of 1% to be, let's say, uh, precise in the wording. Uh, you, you, you want something more, right? And um, let's then see how we can um, apply her criteria to this standard statistical testing scenario. Okay, so let's say, uh, let's briefly recall S1. So S1 was H agrees with the data. And this was mean in a, in this in this context that H1 uh, passes, let's say, a test when the null hypothesis is rejected at the specified uh, type one error level alpha because this means that let's say the data are probably in the tail of the distribution which agrees better with uh, H1 than which with uh, H0. Um, and uh, then we also need to uh, take account of uh, S2. And this is actually more interesting because here Maya proposes a technical definition. Um, so let's say with high probability H would not have passed the test so well were H4. So here, let's say she needs to explain um, uh, what the probability is. And the idea is the severity with which X, uh, um, H1 passes test T with observed data X is the probability of observing um, uh, a statistic um, that agrees, uh, um, given, so the probability given on H1, um, that the uh, distance uh, from the actual data is actually smaller than the uh, observed distance. And um, since she just considers, let's say, um, uh, uh, these two hypotheses, these, she then identifies uh, not H1 actually with, uh, with the um, hypothesis that mu is equal that then the default value plus the effect size. So the idea is the severity will be bigger anyway for all tests which presuppose a smaller parameter value so the parameter value, which you see in the last slide is actually the worst case and it suffices in order to calculate severity to, um, uh, to focus on this worst case scenario 
and in our, so you have let's say a lower bound on severity and that's what you are interested in severity will be automatically higher for all the values which are more remote from the hypothesis you want to test and then she has this nice thing which is called a severity function um, perhaps i can uh, also give you the link um, because this is something you can update oh, it. The verity function. Let me see whether I can write in the chat. Uh, so you can, uh, no, uh, you can uh, see it. I'm still sharing my screens, right? Yes, yes. <clears throat> so let me see whether I can find a write in the chat somewhere. Chat, chat, chat. Why doesn't it open? Ah, here. Excellent. So here you can also construct severity functions yourself. Um, but you stopped sharing your, your screen. Uh, I see, yeah, yeah, I accidentally clicked on screen sharing, but now I should be there again. Right? Just somewhere else in my slides. Okay. Yes. So let's say the idea of, let's say this, this app, you can try it out yourself uh, when you want during the talk or, uh, or later, is that let's say the severity um, and it's uh, the severity um, function gives, let's say, for each, um, uh, I should perhaps, uh, wait a second. Also go to the app, let's say you have, let's say you give an hypothesis, you have a certain uh, data and let's say you, you can choose, um, uh, you can choose the observed sample mean and you can uh, impose the sample size and population size. And then let's say on the X and then on the X axis, you show that let's say for each um, um, hypo hypothetical popula uh, population mean, um, the severity with which the hypothesis that the, uh, parameter value is greater than that value uh, is tested with respect to the data which you have actually um, um, which you have actually uh, imposed on the left side so you can uh, you can play around with this yourself um, so it's an it's a quite useful tool and Richard Moray a statistician who is a methodologist was actually quite fond of my suggestion has also um, implemented it, but I think we still have good reasons to believe from a conceptual point of view that Maya's explication of severity is not uh, adequate. Because if you look at the, uh, if you look at the mathematical definition <coughs> of the severity of a test, it's basically just an, a one-sided uh, p-value for the modified, for a modified null hypothesis. So let's say you uh, take this new, uh, let's say, sorry, uh, you take uh, mu greater than uh, mu zero plus delta as um, uh, null hypothesis, and you just calculate the p-value with respect to the uh, alternative that the um, uh, um, mean is actually smaller than that value. This is not very new. I mean, this is just name and person, um, uh, um, uh, name and person um, hypothesis testing um, uh, using a Fisherian p-values. Uh, in order to um, um, uh, in order to assess the uh, confirmation of a hypothesis, and uh, as such, it is also susceptible to all the objections that people, including Mayo themselves, have been made to that um, uh, um, to that procedure. So, I will just focus on a couple of objections which are salient from the point of view of. Um, uh, um, uh, the context of severe testing. So one thing that we find rather uh, annoying is that the value of severity function is completely independent from what we considered originally to be the normal or the default state of affairs, that is the null hypothesis. Uh, secondly, the, oh shit, uh, the tested claim is not very specific, so it just says that the uh, parameter value is greater than mu uh, zero plus delta. And uh, third, that uh, the explication of severity is not contrastive, so it doesn't contrast to uh, alternative, and therefore 
let's say, unable to provide a probative test of discrepancies from a tested claim. So in addition, let's say, to the, let's say, conceptual um, objections that we raised against the uh, severity principle, we also think that our specific, um, the specific quantities she suggests for assessing the uh, severity of a test have um, problems that actually miss the point of severe testing, especially when it comes to the lack of context and, let's say, the lack of specificity, which Popper wants, and I think rightly so, to be an essential part of severity. Okay, I now move to base factors and probably also need to speed up a little bit um, and give you a brief uh, introduction um, to that uh, topic. So let's say Bayesian hypothesis testing or Bayesian inference in general is based on the concept of prior and posterior degree of belief. So you interpret probabilities as expressing your uh, subjective expectations of a certain event to happen or a certain hypothesis to be true. And it can actually be shown that this is, let's say, uh, very fruit can be very fruitfully used in science, although it's in the first place, ex it expresses a subjective attitude, can also be, uh, be used to quantify and to express objective scientific uh, claims. So uh, it can, let's say, if you take, let's say, if you look at this division of three big questions in uh, statistical inference, what shall we believe, what shall we do, and what is the evidence for a scientific claim, it is obvious that Bayesian statistics can um, give an answer to what we shall believe um, and by means of the connection between subjective probability and decision theory it can also tell us what we should do but as it's also it can also be shown that it can express what is the evidence for a scientific claim and uh, how does this work so let's say the core principle of bayesian conditionalization and bayesian inferences that whenever you learn evidence E, for example, the result of a uh, statistical experiment. The new new degree in the hypothesis H is updated uh, according to the equality which you see there. So let's say the new degree of belief in H is the conditional degree of H given the evidence E, so just the conditional probability. And then P of H is called the prior probability of H, so the degree of belief you have before learning the evidence, and P of H given E is posterior probability of H, the degree of belief you have after learning the evidence. And these quantities can be related to each other by means of Bayes' theorem, which is just the theorem of mathematics. And then everything you need to make good inferences and good decisions is, in theory, the posterior probability. Just closing the door because it's a bit noisy. Mm -hmm. Now what um, people, let's say, uh, object is, okay, all, all right, this is telling you what you should believe and what you should do, but what about statistical evidence and how we should measure it? So here Bayesian statisticians usually propose the base factor, which is, let's focus on the left term and first side, which is defined uh, as the ratio of the uh, posterior odds of the hypothesis H. So let's say given the evidence E, and to contrasting hypothesis H0 and H1, we look, let's say, as, as the posterior odds of H1, so how much more probable is H1 after learning the data, and we divide them through the prior odds, how much more probable was H1 uh, respect to H0 before learning the data. And this change is supposed to express uh, the uh, impact of the evidence on the assessment of the hypothesis. And then it's a simple consequence of Bayes' theorem that um, the base factor is equal to, or that this ratio of posterior and prior odds is equal to the uh, ratio of uh, the probability of the data given H1 divided by the probability of the data given H0. So the base factor can also be described as the uh, degree, or let's say the ratio to which the um, data are more probable under H1 than under H0. Or as a, let's say, uh, the relative plausibility of the evidence uh, under the two hypotheses. You can then also interpret this quantity um, and um, uh, yeah, I've now changed, uh, let's say, uh, the order of the two hypotheses, but the idea is that value is greater than 100 or uh, smaller than 0.5. 
1 over uh, 100 express very strong evidence for one of the two hypotheses. Between 10 and 100, it's strong evidence. Between 3 and 10, it's moderate evidence, and vice versa for the um, inverses of these quantities. And uh, one expresses indifference between the two hypotheses. They explain the data equally well. Um, there is a lot of advantages that base factors have with respect to classical uh, non hypothesis test. So it's possible to quantify evidence for the non hypothesis, which was impossible in uh, significance testing. You can also distinguish between positive evidence for H0 and inconclusive evidence. It's also very nice, right? Uh, let's, let's say, I mean, um, in uh, one of the disadvantages of classical statistical testing is that. You cannot, when a null hypothesis is not rejected, you cannot distinguish between positive evidence for it and just evidence being inconclusive for rejecting it. And um, uh, also a couple of other uh, advantages, which I um, um, don't go into the details also for reasons of time and because that's not really essential to the uh, topic. Um, from a severity-based perspective, people would object, well, this is a um, purely ex post measure of evidence, so it um, doesn't, um, um, doesn't involve any severity-related components. Uh, it's just, let's say, basically performance of the uh, hypothesis on the data. There are no error probabilities in this account of uh, um, um, statistical evidence, and therefore also no account of CVF testing. So this is the objection I would like to focus on in the rest of the talk. And that's also what Mayo says. I'm not, uh, um, I'm not reading at all, just focus on the second paragraph. Um, that is why base factors are at odds with the severity re requirement. I'm not saying in principle they couldn't be supplemented in order to control uh, error probabilities, nor that if you tell Bayesians what you want, they can't arrange it. I'm just uh, just saying that the data dredged hypothesis that finds its way into a significance test can also find its way into a base factor. So she says that base, Bayesian statistics has no advantage with respect to significance testing when it comes to data dredging. Uh, um, okay, that's basically um, uh, what we discussed before. I'm just, um, uh, it's just uh, in, in Mayo's words, um, and now what let's say I would like to uh, do in the, uh, the rest of the talk um, is to answer why Bayesians should care about severity, uh, how can Bayesians can account for it, and what are the advantages of Bayesian inference in CVS tests. So why should we adopt it instead of Myers account or significance testing in C in the first place? Um, answer to the first question is clear because severity, uh, severity is just an important methodological virtue. We have also seen this uh, before. Um, and uh, the hard bits and the ones that I'm uh, working on in, uh, now are the second question and the third question. So we will focus in tackling the second question. We will especially focus on the specificity of hypothesis and uh, predictions. Mm. Let's see how what base factors can deliver here. So one thing they can do is, let's say, they can measure the expected evidential value of a hypothesis test. Let's say, suppose that you agree that for the post, uh, for the pure performance of the hypothesis on the data, the base factors are an adequate uh, measure of uh, statistical evidence. Then you can ask yourself the question before conducting the experiment, whether given the design of the experiment, um, given the design of the test, whether the base factor will discriminate between the two hypotheses or perhaps whether the sample is too small in order to achieve this. And uh, this expected evidential value of a hypothesis test can be operationalized by means of the expected absolute log base factor. So the idea is that for, let's say, for both of the uh, two hypotheses, H0 and H1, you calculate the uh, expectation uh, of the base factor or for reasons of mathematical convenience and scaling the logarithmic base factor, uh, and you integrate it with the uh, probability density um, of the various 
uh, observations uh, you can make. And so you can see whether your experiment is actually likely to give you strong evidence for either hypothesis or not. So, oh yeah, one of the reasons why you want to uh, integrate over the logarithms is, of course, that uh, the log base factor will be negative if the uh, experiment favors uh, H0, and it will be positive in, if, in the experiment favors H1. But let's say the experiment will be distinctive. Let's say, uh, let's say a high log base factor uh, will indicate strong evidence for one of the two hypotheses, and this is why you want to work with the log base factor and with absolute values just for uh, purposes of explanation. And there's actually also a way how um, uh, people are doing this actually, uh, not with log base factors, but with standard base factors, which is called base factor design analysis. It has been uh, proposed a couple of years ago by two methodologists, Schoenwald and uh, Wachemakers, who is also my co-author. Um, and um, um, the base factor design um, analysis incorporates expected evidential values systematically into the design of experiments. So suppose you have two competing hypotheses, then you look how the expected base, how the base factor will be uh, um, uh, distributed um, given the experiments, both let's say if H0 is true and if H1 is true. And this gives you a way of calculating the probability of misleading statistical evidence. If it's in the green area, the um, uh, evidence is pointing towards the right hypothesis, uh, true hypothesis. If it's in the red area, it's uh, pointing towards the uh, red, uh, so the false hypothesis. If it's in the yellow area, it will be inconclusive. So this, this is, will show you basically how, uh, let's say, how uh, useful your test is, how much information your test will provide and uh, whether it's really a severe test of these two hypotheses. In these cases, with such a large area of uh, inconclusive results, we probably won't say that it's a severe test. Also, the error rates in the first, if the um, um, uh, null hypothesis is true with 9.6% uh, is pretty high. And um, um, the specificity of the tested hypothesis will naturally be mirrored in a sharper distribution of values. So the more specific you make your, uh, the tested hypothesis, the uh, more will also the base, the, uh, the base factor design, the design analysis show to, let's say, more peaked uh, distributions. So um, if we have um, already um, um, to quite specific hypothesis about the effect size that we compare, which also, or if we increase the sample size, which has the same effect, then we will also see that the green area will increase and the other areas will shrink. So let's say the tests get more, uh, more severe. So let's say from the point of view of a base factor design analysis, uh, making the hypothesis more specific has a clear um, uh, positive effect on the severity of a test. So um, now we have um, uh, increased the sample size. Uh, more specifically, um, if we now look at um, uh, this, this graph, we also see, let's say, this is also by two methodologists in psychology, Peschler and Roberts. They have um, this, uh, the, this idea that uh, we get, have strong support when we have a very specific um, uh, prediction and also, uh, also uh, let's say, uh, or a very specific hypothesis, um, which is uh, individuated by, or which is, uh, corresponds in the graph to these small crosses and uh, also a very small range of data, which is consistent with the theory. We have weak support when, uh, um, let's say, also, let's say, uh, of course, in the case when we have a very vague hypothesis and a very large range of um, uh, uh, results which are compatible with this theory, because these are, let's say, cases where the uh, test has clearly been not severe. But they say we also have big support when we have, this is the upper right case, um, very vague hypothesis, which um, uh, um, gives us um, um, uh, where the... Um, uh, consistence, the range of consistent results is small, but still the uh, hypothesis is rather vague. 
and it's also the same if um, um, the uh, a range of consistency uh, results is large, even when the hypothesis is very specific. So ideally, we have specific hypothesis and also uh, very, um, uh, let's say, uh, quite high probability of observing inconsistent uh, results, which are not necessarily the same thing. So let's look at it just from the point of view of a simple binomial model. So we now con uh, consider a hypothesis that occupies 1% of the parameter space. So that let's say um, uh, this is, let's say, for two different drugs. Uh, drug A has, uh, let's say, um, uh, um, a success rate between 70 and 80%, and drug B has a success rate between 20 and uh, 30%. And um, uh, then we can, let's say, these are the probability distributions that correspond to this um, uh, hypothesis if our sample size is 10. Uh, we can uh, compare this with the wake hypothesis where, let's say, we say, okay, the drugs have a um, success rate between 50% and 100%. And between 0% and 50%, you see that the uh, predictions are much less spiked. And of course, this effect will increase if we have bigger and more realistic sample sizes. And in this case, let's say we have um, this, this hypothesis already, already occupies 25% of the parameter space, whereas the previous one, more specific one, occupied just 1%. How does this work out on the uh, level of base factor? So the, let's say if you have a heat map where uh, large, darker areas correspond to higher base factors, um, it means that um, in the first case, let's say the base factor, if we have, let's say, uh, the predictions are indeed on target for the specific hypothesis, and the base factor will be quite high. And it will sharply decline if we move away from uh, the uh, predicted uh, result. Um, if we have, let's say, um, uh, uh, the um, um, uh, again, a specific hypothesis but a lower sample size, then the base factor will already decline. Um, uh, substantially, mm. <clears throat> let's say from 16 to 4. And uh, so these hypotheses are, by the way, I didn't uh, explain this, tested against an encompassing model where we just um, have a prior distributed over the entire parameter space. And we can also, let's say, uh, reproduce this, the two other, um, um, two other figures in Porsche Peschler's and Robert's um, uh, graph. So we can, let's say, uh, look at the base factor heat map for the two wake hypothesis, um, where you have, um, 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 where you have in the first case a higher sample size, and in the second case uh, a low sample size. And again, you see that the support is rather weak or at best moderate in both cases. So let's say we can reproduce the diagnosis by Petula and Roberts also one-to-one -one by specific hypothesis with specific predictions and high sample sizes actually um, are more lead to more severe tests and more <coughs> and stronger result, a stronger support for the tested hypothesis. Okay. Uh, so this is the good news we can, and let's just summarize, let's say from a conceptual point of view, um, the uh, achievements uh, of this work. So severe testing is, I think, an important concept in scientific and statistical inference. I think on this point, both Popper and Mayo are right. Uh, important components of severe testing are the specificity of predictions and the stringent scrutiny of tested hypothesis. This is also what Popper has already uh, suggested um, and Mayo has also taken it up. But I think that Mayo's, or we think that Mayo's explication via the severity principle or via the severity requirement is not satisfactory. It is not, it doesn't give an explicit um, account of why the tested hypothesis needs to be specific. And it actually, in the typical case of uh, plotting the severity function, it's rather unspecific. And uh, it doesn't also uh, evaluate um, performance with respect to a default state of affairs or alternatives. Um, so this is uh, the, uh, the negative part. The positive part is that we think that base factors is actually a good tool for explicating severity because 
from a pre-experimental point of view, we can evaluate experiments in terms of the expected absolute log base factor. Um, uh, so we can evaluate the uh, severity of a test um, pre-experimentally. Um, and I think Bayesians should do this and Bayesians have perhaps not done this enough in the uh, last years and decades in order to convince the scientific community and the frequentist statisticians. And the base factor data design analysis is a particular a particularly a good tool for, let's say, analyzing the probability of misleading evidence and uh, taking into account error statistical considerations. And uh, post-experimentally, this was the point of what I did at the, uh, as, as, uh, at the end um, of the previous section, is that the we can see that the specificity of hypothesis indeed conducive to a higher absolute base factor and also to a sharper gap or to a bigger gap between successful the base factor for successful predictions and the base factor if the predictions are a little bit off the maximum likelihood value. So let's say specific hypothesis help you to get better tests. And so we see that Popper and Bayes are perhaps not that big antagonists and that it's possible to implement Popperian uh, thoughts into Bayesian statistics or vice versa. Vice versa that Bayesian statistics can also express some uh, important thoughts that Popper had on the scientific method. And then I would like to thank you a lot for your attention. Also, uh, the usual uh, thank you to uh, uh, the European Research Council, which has funded uh, this research. And um, I'm looking forward to Barbara's commentary and to the discussion. Many thanks, uh, Jan, for this excellent talk. Uh, before joining the general discussion, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Barbara Osimani from the Polytechnic University uh, in Marche, Italy. So Barbara will uh, have a few comments on some aspects of Jan's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Lukas. So I'm sharing my screen and my few slides. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I cannot see it. Okay, just uh, okay. So thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to this exciting uh, workshop. I really like uh, Jan's uh, Jan's work. I'm very keen on uh, Bayesian epistemology, Bayesian statistics, and specifically on Jan Sprenger's approach uh, to philosophy of science. So I am a very biased commentator. <laughs> so let's think about a little bit about severe testing. I mean, it has been over, it has been operationalized uh, by Mayo in a specific way, but I would like a little bit to open up uh, um, the discussion by thinking about how it can be further conceptual, be considered Popper's uh, th first thought, a theory should count as confirmed only if it has survived repeated and stringent attempts to prove it wrong. In a sense, we should look for evidence against it. Um, I think here there is a sort of, I mean, uh, during the last decades, we had a lot of also discussion in statistics about uh, uh, let's say uh, scientific integrity. So there is, or wish we're thinking about the scientists, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the scientific reforms and uh, methodological uh, discussions have this implicit, uh, let's say, um, I don't know what you know, Il Convitato di Pietra by Mozart. Uh, they have this in, uh, uninvited guest which is a uh, possible wishful thinking of the uh, of the researcher or even fraud I mean and so we try to uh, go against this kind of manipulation of evidence uh, also by uh, looking at evidence which should run against our wishful thinking or our bias but what does this mean I mean it can be of course, increasing accuracy, as uh, Jan already told us. So this increases the probability that the theory will be found wrong, uh, because if the, uh, the theory and the hypothesis make specific uh, predictions, then a lot of uh, data uh, can falsify these kind of predictions, proportionally speaking. But this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 
attempt implicitly puts chance, uh, chance of false negatives against the cause and interpretation of results. So there is this alternative hypothesis more that we have a chancy guess. Uh, and if, you, if we have a, a, a large uh, range of data that can be confirmed by, uh, that the, can confirm the theory, then of course our chances are higher that we confirm the theory. However, there are other ways in which we could uh, test the uh, hypothesis severely, which can be, uh, I mean, by design, of course, and by research design, I don't only mean stopping rules or sample sizes, but also randomization versus observation, for instance. So the idea is here to explain alternative hypotheses for a possible confirmation of the theory. So we, we thought that we measured some cause, but indeed we measured another cause, a common, a common cause or a collider and things like that. So severity of intervention or that can be reverse causation, whatever. Uh, severity can be also fleshed out in terms of uh, uh, research design, that is intervention that versus observation. This is a, a way to give reality the opportunity to push us back. And this is in Chang's active realism. Um, I, I, this is not an objection to Mayo's approach or to, or to the Bayesian approach. This is something that has not been, I think, considered uh, enough in uh, statistics. But of course, because there is a division of labor between statistics, which is about tracking and uh, managing uncertainty derived from the play of chance, from uh, other kinds of uncertainty, uh, which uh, derive about the data generating mechanism, the causal structure of nature, and the causal structure, uh, 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 more generally speaking, of uh, the instrument that we're using to detect uh, natural signals. My, my point would be uh, to ask Jan whether we can uh, further develop his approach uh, by taking into account these three points. I mean, the, the second and the third point. So uh, in my starting severe testing, uh, Jan already to agree with the data, but with high probability H would not have passed the test so well where H falls. So there is a sort of counterfactual thinking and the high probability measures uh, the corroboration of H, but so well uh, uh, it's interesting is the actual result. So it's a post data inference. This is very interesting because oh, data, but my connection is not is a little bit unstable. Um, because uh, with this, Mayo succeeded in uh, transforming a tool set, uh, frequency statistics, I mean, uh, Neiman Pearson or Fisher uh, hypothesis testing, uh, transforming this tool that can, in, in principle, cannot say anything about the probability of the hypothesis or anything about the hypothesis, but just about the probability of the data given uh, that the process is false or true. Yeah? Um, in a tool, that, in a meta-inferential tool that tells us something about the theory, the hypothesis. So, I mean, this is something that we should uh, pay heed to and in Mayo's uh, work. Uh, the Bayesian approach by Sprenger Dali is an information theoretic approach. And uh, this is uh, very important to be emphasized, I think, because, uh, I mean, there are also other uh, promising uh, avenues in this sense. I mean, I didn't know about Luke's uh, work, but Glenn Schaefer is uh, trying to shade a lot in this information theoretic approach instead of the error probability approach is that it is in general much more informative. It, uh, I mean, apart from the fact that uh, the frequency approach is dichotomic, uh, but you just have this area and be, whether you belong to this area or not, whether the data belong to this area or not, then you decide to accept, reject, whatever accept, reject mean. Instead, the information theoretic approach generally uses um, more or less implicitly uh, distance measures uh, uh, across probability distributions. And this is, for instance, a, a sort of uh, the expected evidential value is a sort of distance measures, measure between the probability distributions. And um, I think with this, one uh, loses much less information in uh, evaluating the probability uh, value of the evidence. And this is, I think, the major uh, advantage of this kind of approaches. This is also then uh, 
let's say, reiterated in this measure of corroboration, uh, I mean, the Bayesian factor between the, the specific hypothesis and the uh, encompassing uh, model, which is directly proportional to the fit, as we could see in the heat map that Jana illustrated us, and inversely uh, um, proportional to the complexity, that is uh, to uh, the range, uh, let's say the degree of, the free, of freedom that the theory allows uh, the data to have. So one uh, over Fi denotes how much the positive distribution of Hi is in agreement with the encompassing model He. I would like Jan then to speak a little bit more about all this uh, part because I, it was very interesting. And uh, for some part could be um, for philosophers of science, explicate it um, step by step more gradually, <laughs> which includes, uh, and, uh, and the I, uh, one over CI denotes the same quantity for the prior HI, so the complexity. Uh, so severity in uh, Sprenger et al. is the ability of an experimental design uh, to discriminate the hypothesis at hand. It is more flexible. Uh, may cover points when free above more easily than the frequentist approach. However, how exactly? I mean, uh, of course, with by means of the likelihood principle, we can put anything in the likelihood, but maybe it would be interesting to suggest how we can operationalize the points uh, one, three uh, above, um, because there is a complex relation to complexity <laughs> of, uh, 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 of the theories. Uh, the role of assumptions about the data generating mechanisms and how can piecemeal inference be accommodated in the sense that piecemeal is what mm, we mean by having of course, more tests about the assumptions themselves of the data generating mechanism uh, or testing uh, relevant parameters, etc. So this is my uh, small contribution to a paper which I really much enjoyed and I really recommend to read for those who didn't have yet. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Tash. Thank you, Barbara. Jan, would you like to comment? Yes, very briefly, of course. I don't want to cut too much into the uh, general discussion. Let me also restart okay. my screen. Sorry, I'm trying to stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, no worries, I don't share. I don't need to share anything. Okay. So yes, uh, thank you very much for a very um, uh, kind and but also um, challenging uh, commentary in the sense that you uh, mention important research questions, which I should probably uh, or we should probably work on uh, in the next months and years. Um, I think all points are uh, fair. I don't really, it's, I mean, I'm not yet sure whether I can, um, let's say, uh, give you a story that will convince you, let's say, um, ex exclusion of the alternative explanatory hypothesis. There one would probably perhaps work in the framework of Bayesian abductive inference, which is something that I am not really, um, uh, an uh, expert on, but I know that people have been working uh, uh, on this uh, quite a bit. Um, assumption of data about data generating mechanisms in severe testings. So this is also um, something that probably should be studied in more detail here. I'm less sure what would be the right methodology, but uh, anyway, uh, something we can, uh, let's say, perhaps also uh, get back to a discussion if you have any suggestions. Um, I want to say uh, just two things on the information theoretical approach. So um, I think that's an interesting way of uh, characterizing um, what we are doing. And so it's, you should also show the formula, which um, is um, which I didn't include into the talk because I thought if I am, if I have to explain what an encompassing, encompassing prior is, things get too uh, complicated. But let's say. Uh, the idea is uh, what we are doing is we are uh, in the ex in the um, uh, um, graphs I showed you at the end of the talk. So I don't know whether I can still uh, I can uh, share slides. Probably Barbara, you need to unshare first. Yes, but ah, uh, I hope I I was, uh, 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 let me just uh, <coughs> share briefly my slides. So what we are doing here, the base, the, this, this calculation of base factors, um, is relative to um, 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 uh, to a, let's say of this, let's say of the uh, specific hypothesis or the vague hypothesis, 
with respect to an encompassing prior. And the encompassing prior is just a certain default prior uh, put over all the uh, parameter um, um, range can be uniform, but need not be uniform. Of course, if you have, let's say, the entire real line, you need to use something else. And um, the point is then that this can be, if you do some mathematical manipulations, which we do in the paper, but which we, uh, which I uh, decided not to implement, you can write this in a way that you can in interpret the base vector between the specific and the encompassing uh, prior as a trade-off of uh, fit and uh, complexity. So I'm now closing this, which means I should, yes, again be on the video. Great. And um, um, this is also, let's say, from a philosophical point of view, quite interesting. Because we had in Popper's quote, we have these two points that let's say degree of corroboration is essentially a function of the severity of the test and uh, the degree to which it has stood up to this test. And let's say if you have, let's say, this information theoretic approach where the two determinants of the evidence measure are, uh, can be written as um, one element representing fit and one uh, element representing complexity or specificity. That's exactly what you want, right? So I think that's actually quite a nice, uh, quite a nice agreement. Or like, uh, and I'm thank I'm grateful to you for pointing um, for pointing this out, and because I think it agrees also quite, let's say, this mathematical representation, which has not been in invented by us, but by Kluchkist and Heiting, two Dutch methodologists, also fits quite well with, uh, let's say, the Popper quote on. Um, both past performance and uh, uh, severity or specificity being um, elem uh, essential elements of degree of corroboration. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. So I think we have uh, some 20 minutes for a general discussion. Please uh, type Q into chat if you want to pose a question. Okay, meanwhile, oh, Bart. Yeah, I did not want to go first, but. Go ahead, please, yeah. So very interesting, Jan, and thank you for your talk. I learned uh, many things and also uh, would like to have so much time to think further about what you have been teaching, me uh, at least. Um, so uh, one, uh, one, my first thought uh, during your lecture was uh, actually also hinted at by Barbara, that was this idea of data generation. And that's something that I'm also interested in. And uh, so I've worked, for instance, on Bayesian networks in the past, and uh, they also have this kind of generative mechanism uh, underlying them. And, and I was just wondering whether you have some initial thoughts about that. You mentioned something like, when, uh, when Barbara uh, hinted at this uh, discussion that this depends on methodological choices. Would then, for instance, the study of Bayesian networks make sense in this connection or something like that? Hmm. Um, good question. I think I don't have yet a clear idea uh, on this. Um, so what ex can you can you perhaps make the uh, the question again a little bit more specific? So what would, let's say, what would be the problem that you would uh, you would like me to be able to um, uh, to tackle. So you did not really speak about data data generating mechanisms that mm -hmm. could also be let's say one aspect of a theory. A theory could itself be data generating, mm -hmm. and the way I look at Bayesian networks, for instance, is as as a concise uh, representation of a distribution, probability distribution, that yes. has a generative effect. So Bayesian network is itself a theory of, a, of the structure, the mm -hmm. internal structure of a probability distribution with a generative effect. So sometimes uh, Bayesian networks are nicely small, uh, nicely concise representations of uh, a distribution. And that could count as, as, as something that that is a, a good property of um, of a theory about the distribution. 
does this make sense in, in how you speak about theories and data and severe testing, or is it completely different? Uh, I think the closest the closest that comes to let's say uh, to the uh, to the questions you, the, the answer that comes close to the question you raised would probably be something like this. Um, I mean, I haven't really thought about Bayesian networks in the context of this particular research, but I mean, as you know, um, quite often. Um, when we are doing inference, let's say when we decide between different causal models uh, represented by base nets, uh, we have to make also statistical testing procedures in order to decide between them. Plus some, I know that some algorithms for making these choices are basically based on frequent test, uh, testing uh, uh, procedures, usually it's classical significance testing. I think if you want to work with base nets in the first place, it would also be let's would also be um, adequate or appropriate to um, rephrase these testing procedures um, uh, using Bayesian um, statistical inference. I think this has also probably been done. Probably uh, been done, and then one could also perhaps, um, dependent on how one conceptualizes these testing procedures, uh, say that this theory, because the Bayesian base nets does not only represent a probability distribution, but also uh, if the errors, at least if the errors are oriented, also a certain causal hypothesis, then one could also, let's say, um, uh, that the theory is, uh, has been severely tested to some degree. But um, I mean, I'm now um, thinking as I speak, so I don't know whether this avenue of research is uh, fruitful, but. Yeah, I think it could be uh, it could be an interesting question. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? So I can continue, but I also would like to give the floor to others, of course. Please go ahead if no one is now posing. Oh, Barbara, I haven't seen it in. In okay. Yes, go ahead. No, it's a little bit uh, close to Bart. I mean, whether a hierarchical base can also be useful in this sense, um, just um, just a suggestion. Mm. Yeah, this is also something we should uh, we need exploring, I guess, because hierarchical base uh, models are uh, so familiar now, so common now in uh, many sciences. And it would also, let's say, if you want to uh, give an account of CBA testing using Bayesian inference, and perhaps also on a different level of, let's say, theoretical uh, abstraction and on um, prediction of experimental data, probably we should also say something about um, how hierarchical Bayesian methods um, uh, can um, uh, can play a role in the uh, the picture that uh, we described. I mean, so far we have been dealing with let's say simple experimental hypothesis, things that medical scientists and um, psychologists encounter in their uh, experiments and about hypo parameters uh, um, and hypothesis. Let's say hypothesis about parameters that correspond to measurable quantities. But um, of course, so, it would be really sorry for Perhaps introduce more layers of theoretical yeah. or maybe uh, also connecting to Bart. Then I give you the, the word, the room again. Uh, model um, leveraging models uh, tools to possibly model different causal structures. This can be also instead of using just two hypotheses, maybe you can have different hypotheses about the causal structure and average them uh, in a Bayesian way. Maybe it can be interesting. Yes, I agree. Good suggestion. Okay, Bars, do you want to continue? Yeah, sure. So, um, the, um, the thing that I'm uh, myself also thinking about is uh, um, the relation between a kind of general hypothesis, like a scientific theory, which says something about the structure of the world or something like that, and a spe specific hypothesis about a specific situation. So I've uh, worked a lot also on uh, reasoning about crimes, evidence in crime situations. So there is the question, who committed the murder? 
And that's a different kind of hypothesis, uh, or at least my, my naive interpretation of what I see happening in philosophy of science and, and in what, what you speak about is, is, is about a different kind of hypothesis with a general nature. Uh, whereas in, uh, um, in, in, in criminal investigation, the question is, is suspect A really guilty? Why do we believe that suspect A is guilty? Why not suspect B? Should we look for another suspect? So that's very specific. There is only one fact in a sense or one fact situation that we are interested in. And also there you see many, uh, many uh, puzzles of uh, how uh, evidence plays a role, how patterns in the world play a role, how data plays a role. Do you have any insights uh, on that dichotomy? Yes, actually here I think that the approach is rather straightforwardly applicable because mm -hmm. I think of course, mm, we want to bound the uh, probability of erroneous conclusions. I mean, you know, you are probably uh, perhaps not people in the perhaps not necessarily people in the audience, but you, being uh, from the Netherlands, are certainly familiar with the case of Lucia de B, right? Uh, so this um, uh, Dutch nurse, which in which when she was on shift, there were let's say lots of um, uh, or let's say uh, I don't know with that actually a lot of but. Um, suspicious um, um, frequency of, of uh, infants um, dying, and so she was, uh, let's say, sent in the and on the basis of the statistical evidence, she was in the end sentenced for um, for murder, but later acquitted in an appeal procedure. Um, and uh, I don't know where for actually I don't know whether for murder or for just for general homicide, um, but. Um, and then there was also, of course, the question of, let's say, uh, this is an extremely unlikely event. Should we then consider the hypothesis that, which, which was the only ex uh, available explanation that she was actually killing, uh, purposefully killing these infants um, or, or patients? I don't know whether it was actually infants or um, or elderly patients uh, on purpose. Um, um, and here, I think, let's say, it's quite important that. Um, we also um, adopt the Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian approach to evaluating this evidence, because if we don't, we are often stuck with the problem of um, just having um, evidence for a, let's, for a hypothesis, because our, let's say, the default alternative would give an extremely bad uh, prediction of the evidence. But what we would need is actually the procedure which balances, let's say, our prior uh, uh, state of knowledge, or let's say the background knowledge which we have, with the evidence which we are actually gain from the uh, experimental, not here not experimental, but um, from the actual uh, actual case. So um, I think let's say a Bayesian. I think also Meisters and some other statisticians did a Bayesian uh, reanalysis. I think this can actually be very useful because it gives you a very transparent way of um, uh, looking at. Um, what are the different factors um, that uh, have contributed, let's say, to our evidential, to, to our judgment on the strength of the evidence? So, and, and would you say that there is not then a distinction between different kinds of hypotheses, let's say the, the general kind in philosophy of science and the specific kind in, in crime cases? Probably is there the same, be, uh, or is it uh, from from a conceptual perspective the same the same thing that you are looking at only more specific or something like that? Ma, I think probably if you are, let's say have a crime hypothesis, uh, the hypothesis, the hypothesis that somebody is guilty, you probably need to uh, derive from that hypothesis, uh, let's say a certain expectation on the evidence. It's still a rather abstract hypothesis, and you somehow need to connect it to a specific. Uh, hypothesis about the distribution of um, deaths uh, in a shift uh, or, or over a certain number of shifts and so on. But I don't think there is, let's say, apart from this general uh, problem about, let's say, connecting a theoretical hypothesis to a certain experimental observation, I don't think there is a big um, uh, difference between, uh, let's say, standards, the standard hypothesis we investigate in um, experimental sciences and the, uh, these questions in forensic science. But I'm not an expert on forensic um, science. And so this makes me very curious, Jan, because uh, for me, this is still uh, something that is not, not straight in my head. 
and uh, and I, I don't know whether you happen to know that, but I now post in the chat uh, a project that I led for a while ago that was exactly on all the, all of this, but not the philosophy of science uh, part. So mm -hmm. this is about Lucia de Burke, mm -hmm. and let's say the the rational handling of evidence using different techniques, among them also Bayesian. Mm -hmm. Oh, I will definitely have a look. Let me uh, already yeah. open the uh, link and, and uh, we'll have a look at it later. Well, and, and so what I'm still thinking of is how to make from what we what we learned from in that project to philosophy of science, because that is a natural idea also from my perspective. And I see a lot of things that are very interesting in how you speak about uh, theory testing, severe testing. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that I, I would like to think on further. And for you, it seems to be let's say on the same um, on the same page more or less but i've not yet well, I, well i'm i'm st i still have questions yeah thank you very much yeah. i'll have a look okay further questions maybe meanwhile i i have also a question sort of clarificatory um, i was uh, thinking if there is uh, any room for uh, severe testing with respect to uh, deductive consequences of, of hypotheses. It's a sort of question related to, to BART. Uh, if I would take two extreme cases, uh, one where the uh, null and uh, alternative uh, imply uh, the same evidence, so in that case, it's it's not discriminatory, and the bias factor is, is just one. So uh, it, it's not possible to to have a severe test for for those same uh, hypotheses. But in case uh, if uh, one of the hypotheses implies the evidence, while the the alternative implies the negation of the evidence, uh, wouldn't it be a problem for for bias factor? analysis to, to make sense of uh, uh, saying that uh, the evidence is, uh, or the test with respect to the evidence uh, represents a severe testing of, uh, of the hypothesis. Be, you think because the base factor, or let's say the uh, probability of the data given one of the two hypotheses would be zero, so we couldn't, uh, we can't, let's say we don't have a very, very defined mathematical expression? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but okay. I think this can be uh, this can be just uh, dealt with by stipulation. Do you just say okay? This is obviously a maximally uh, severe test, or if you want a crucial experiment that will conclusively decide between the one hypothesis, because um, the whatever the result of the experiment will be, it will be incompatible with one of the two hypotheses. And so um, it's just let's say the ideally uh, maximally severe test uh, that will close the case. I mean, the question is, um, uh, let's say, the, the interesting methodological difference between Bayesians and frequentists emerge when we don't have this kind of uh, um, ideally severe test available. The data, data are more noisy and less conclusive. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. Anyone want, wants to pose a question? We have a few more minutes. If not, uh, let me thank again uh, to Jan and, and Barbara and to all of all of you for uh, this morning session. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. I'm also uh, very glad because it's a rather busy uh, week with uh, lots of teaching and administration work that I finally uh, had some time for research. Um, uh, probably if I hadn't had the invitation, I wouldn't have uh, worked on the slides yesterday and I wouldn't have had the, I wouldn't have uh, uh, given this talk, which literally, from which I also learned a lot of important uh, uh, things and got good suggestions. So uh, thank you very much. Um, just I want to apologize that I won't be there in the afternoon because I'm teaching from two o'clock onwards and from two to five and afterwards I'm chairing a talk at an in-person conference here in Turin. So uh, I won't be around in the afternoon, but I wish you a very successful uh, workshop and thanks for your attention. <laughs>